So the autism family experience is kind of our next segment. Um, and as I said earlier, I don't only do this professionally, but I live with it as well. Um, and this is actually where my dissertation comes in handy. <laughs> so um, this is where, where we're going to start now. Um, so, okay, you've walked through this, the process of I don't know what's wrong with my child. I'm not really sure. Pediatrician told me to wait and see. Got the hearing checked. Eventually got evaluated. We have the diagnosis. Most often, um, and this, again, we are talking in generalities across the board today, mm -hmm. but this is where the research points. The research points in the direction of a parent grieving the loss of what they would be considered to have a normal child. Um, <coughs> and so with grief, we all know Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, mm -hmm. um, denial, bargaining, anger, despair, eventually reconciliation. The problem with this is that for most parents, they don't get to that reconciliation stage or they don't stay there. They go back through the process again and again and again. Um, and it often gets kicked up, if you will, um, when milestones aren't met, when as they get older and they, they enter school, um, they don't get invited to a birthday party or they have a birthday party that no one comes to or um, they're not asked to the prom. All, all of these things that you hope and want for your child that, that don't end up happening brings up this grief mm -hmm. again. And so um, Olshansky back in 62 uh, coined the phrase chronic sorrow and that's, mm -hmm. that's how he uses to describe um, parents who have children on the spectrum um, because it is a chronic experience. Again, this is not every parent, but this is where the research points. Okay. So we have that. Then we have stress. Now we're all stressed, right? Life is stressful, period. <laughs> um, we all have financial <laughs> hardships, or most of us do. Um, we all have, you know, strained emotional relationships. You know, no family's perfect. We all have dysfunctional families, and so all of us have emotionally strained family <laughs> connections. But the thing with the f families who have children on the spectrum is that these are oftentimes amplified. Um, we talked about the treatment options, ABA therapy, counseling, speech therapy, occupational therapy. If you're one of the ones who are going across the country trying to get these different supplements and, and treatments and things, that's expensive. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're going to be paying for these services for long periods of time. So it's a huge financial hardship for most families. The strained emotional relations within the family. So if you can imagine, just you've had a rough day. Your, your child had a meltdown, and you really don't feel like dealing with your spouse and his shenanigans that day, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, <coughs> things are strained. Modifications in family activities and goals. And this is a biggie. Um, they have to be able to modify what they want <laughs> for their child, um, what they want for themselves as a family. You may not have that picture-perfect family that you've always dreamed of. It may look different. And so you have to modify what your expectations are. And some, for some people, that's a very stressful and difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Impact on the social <coughs> life. Um, it can be very isolating. A lot of parents have a tough time taking their kids out to the grocery store, taking their kids out to family events. Um, and so they just kind of coil back and stay within their homes and don't really live that social life. Mm -hmm. um, lose friends, lose connections because of that. Complexity and time burns of treatment. So again, all those treatments, right? You have your 40 hour <laughs> work week and somehow you're supposed to be able to fit in 40 hours of ABA therapy plus occupational therapy and all these other things. <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot to manage. Um, some families housing adaptations. She mentioned sleep earlier. I had a client one time, uh, their daughter, significant sleep issues and it got to where it wasn't safe for her at night. Um, so what they did was they cut her bedroom door in half, kind of like what you see in a barn. 
so that mm -hmm. way the bottom was locked and she could stay in her room safely, but the top was open so that they could hear. Mm. Um, and so that she didn't feel trapped in there, right? She could still stick her head out, but she couldn't get out of the room. That way they could sleep at night. Um, but she wasn't restrained either. She still had her whole bedroom to move around in and play. Um, educational hardships. If you have family who wants to go to college or, you know, adults who you know, the parent might want to go back to school or something, or for that child they want to get to school, that's one piece. Then you also have the public school and all the challenges of getting the services for your child. Mm -hmm. um, lots of challenges usually for many families in that area. So that's an added stressor that your neurotypical families don't really have to deal with. And then again, that chronic sorrow, that chronic grieving process. So all the stressors that a typical family would have plus more and then amplified, okay? Um, and the siblings. <coughs> yes, and then we pregnant. have the siblings, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. Um, symptomatology and behavior problems, so if the child is aggressive, if the child engages in self-injurious behavior or SIB, um, that's positively correlated with increased stress, as you can imagine. But we handle stresses differently. Again, generalities, but the research points to a whole host of lists down here for the mothers. And a few things for dad. <laughs> Mothers just, we just like to worry, right? <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> we, we're worriers. Um, so we take on the care demands and the social support, and we might feel restricted in our roles because maybe we can't work like we wanted. we got to stay home more, um, or we can't have the job that we wanted because we got to be close to home. We can't have that commute to the, the other side of Houston because I need to be able to get to the school down the street if I need to. Um, spousal relationships, family cohesiveness, poor physical health, depression, excessive time demands, parental burnout, which we'll get to, child's dependency on the mother, effect on the family, future psychological problems. So that's the whole list of the mother side of additional stressors that she's going to be most likely experiencing. On the father's side, um, it, his stress more typically comes from the child's temperament. Um, the child's behavior, how, how severe, how severely impacted is, is the child's behavior, how, um, if they've been able to accept or not their child's limitations. Um, and they tend to have a more difficult um, time establishing a solid bond, a, sol a, a relationship with their child. So two big points for dad, lots of points for mom, both legitimate, both mm -hmm. equally you know, stressful, but moms tend to carry more of the weight in general. So what does that mean? We'll talk about mental health. The national population across the board, the rates of depression are 14 to 28 percent within a person's lifetime. A person who has a child with a chronic illness, so something medical, 19 percent. So right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lifetime prevalence of major mood disorders for those who have a child on the spectrum is over 40%. So all of those stressors, all of those hardships, talk about it being amplified, definitely has an impact on the parents. And this is also more common and recurs over and over more in mothers. Remember that list of stressors. Mm -hmm. Okay. the marriage. <laughs> Used to, the rates pointed to higher divorce <laughs> rates. That's not the case anymore. They say it's about the same as the national mm. average. But what they do point to is lower rates of marital satisfaction and higher rates of turmoil. So what does that tell you? The parents are staying together, but they're not happy. Why are they staying together? Probably because of all those things we talked about that the child needs. Financially, it, it makes sense for them to stay together in the best interest of the child, but we have a stressed out mm -hmm. marriage, okay? And what about the siblings? It's interesting because you see, I see a lot of times if the <coughs> older child is on the spectrum, 
the younger child will sometimes exhibit some of the mm-hmm. symptoms, not because they have it, but because they're learning mm-hmm. from their older sibling. They're modeling after them. Um, so if you have an older child who hand flaps, you might have a younger one who hand flaps, but not on the spectrum. And actually, I went to um, a preschool about a month ago, and it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I had four children in that preschool classroom of about 15, all hand flapping. <laughs> Only one of those children <laughs> were on the spectrum. The other three <laughs> were mimicking the one. I'd, it was it just baffled me. When I got mm-hmm. there, I was like, which child am I supposed to be looking <laughs> at? I'm so confused right now. Um, and so sometimes you'll see siblings do that. Yeah, I had a case like that, um, brothers, and they were very close in age but it was the younger one who was on the spectrum and the older one that would do some of the things that the younger one did. Mm-hmm. And it was like, are they both or is he imitating? Yeah, so that's where evaluations again come in mm-hmm. handy. Um, but you, you might see language and cognitive um, differences mm-hmm. in the siblings. They usually catch up by, by the time they're five, four and a half, five years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but you might see some differences there. You might see some differences in their, just their self-concept. Um, you might see some differences in the way they relate to other children because if their only sibling is on the spectrum and that's where you learn to relate to, mm-hmm. that might impact their ability to learn how to engage appropriately because they don't have it with their natural sibling, right? Um, and then behavioral functioning can be impacted as well. Um, again, one child tantrums, he gets his way, so I'm going to tantrum to get my way, you know, those kinds of things. On the mental health side, we see social dysfunction and isolation, um, affective disorders, so mood disorders, behavior problems, um, and less intimacy, pro-social behavior, and nurturance from the siblings as well. Again, generalities, but this mm-hmm. is what the research points to. Okay. Um, a long time ago, well, maybe some of you were here when Joe Roach was on the city council. Joe Roach was a dwarf. Um, very capable man. He was an attorney and then ran for city council and, and served a term or two. Well, way back in my other life, I, was in, I worked in the public schools, and his mother was a teacher of the gifted and talented. And so I got to know her fairly well. She said to me s- something that has stuck with me about how difficult it was to maintain balance between Joe and his sister, who was normal height when they were little because Joe was the special one and he was cute as a bug. So he got a lot of attention, but they had to make sure that their daughter got ten attention and special time as mm-hmm. well. So it would be relatively easy for parents of a child with a physical disability that isn't quite as demanding as a child with spectrum disorder. But still, there's that balance too that has to be maintained mm-hmm. and another stressor for mom. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and we'll talk about how to help the siblings a little bit later, but most definitely mm-hmm. um, the siblings can be impacted as well. Oftentimes mm-hmm. they end up being very mature individuals. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they mature a little too fast, and they become an, another parent in the house, and yeah. we don't want that either. We want them to be able to be kids. Um, but we can't ignore the fact that they can be impacted as well. So, morning signs of parental burnout. Anyone in here feel burnt out? <laughs> <laughs> I know some. <laughs> I know I do on occasion. Mm-hmm. Um, so signs of parental burnout. Fatigue, irritability, you're just on edge. Um, increased anger and resentment, possibly even towards your child or your children. Um, you might be sick more. Oftentimes mental health um, concerns mm-hmm. come out physically. We call that somatization. So stress headaches. You know, your back is always aching because you're stressed. There's a connection. There's a mind-body connection. Oftentimes, if you're not taking good care of yourself, you're going to see the doctor a lot because you might be just more sick. Um, We talked about social isolation earlier as a result of just the complexity of having a child on the spectrum, but in addition to that, just not feeling. Like, even if you don't have to take your kid out, you have someone to take care of them for you, and you want to go, but then you don't, just because you just don't have the energy and you want to stay home. You catch yourself doing that a lot. That's a Mm -hmm. sign. 
um, withdraw an emotional attachment. You feel yourself emotionally slipping away from those you, you love and care about. Um, feeling working harder for your family, but enjoying it less. So overworked, underappreciated. I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that <laughs> at some point. Um, but if you feel like that's happening a lot, that's another sign. Feeling a lack or a loss of control. Um, and feeling inadequate in your job as a parent or as though you're not a good enough parent. Um, all signs of burnout. Mm -hmm. Parents of children with special needs are at a significantly higher rate than the average parent to experience burnout. <coughs> the issue with that is parents who are burnt out can't engage their children like they need. And so we have this vicious cycle. Right? We want and need to be able to engage our children. We need, and, and that goes for all children. Mm -hmm. But especially if you have a child on the spectrum, you've got to keep them engaged in order to keep them from mm -hmm. closing up into their world and hyper-focusing on that one thing all the time. You've got to be able to pull them out. And if we're not doing that because we're not feeling it, or we're too tired or we're too burnt out, we're not helping them. And they're, in turn, mm -hmm. getting worse in their behavior. They might show more tantrums. They may not be progressing as well as they could be with their language and their behavior and things because you're not giving them what they need. So, And therefore, that's impacting you, and you're feeling even worse. So it's, again, it's this vicious cycle, which is <laughs> why self-care <laughs> is so, 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 so important. I, I have a question about what you just said. Mm -hmm. You were talking about how it was important for the parent or the caregiver to keep the child close. I don't know how you phrase it. Engaged. Engaged. Mm -hmm. um, how, I know that they have their calming behavior, you know, hand slapping and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. How do you ever know how much of that is helpful for them for them to calm themselves and when it switches to them just, you know, disappearing inside their own head and then mm -hmm. they won't come back out, you know. It's you a know really good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's I try to think of it as a balance. It's got to be a balance. You know, if the child needs a place to go off and stem and that's what helps them to calm, that's but okay. If they don't stop. But if they don't stop, that's where you've got to pull them back out and you've got to engage them. So, you, you know, you give them a few minutes, but then once those few minutes are up, we're done, we're going to go do something to get you engaged and back into our world. Mm -hmm. um, so it is about balance. Some people will say, no stimming at all. Sit on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> the real I mean, the reality is they're doing it for a reason. Mm -hmm. So unless we give them a functional equivalent to, to replace that behavior, then we need to be letting them do that. But just in a way that's not going to impact their life. Mm -hmm. If they're sitting in their room in their corner flapping all the time, they're not and getting anything. They're not in the world. They're mm -hmm. not engaging. They're not going to progress. So it is allowing them maybe for a few minutes, but then, okay, now we're going to go and we're going to do something else. So it, it's balancing it, really, which is the whole topic mm -hmm. for today is mm -hmm. it's balance. Yeah, but that's a good question. Mm. Buffering against burnout stress. So that 40%, right? 40% of mothers chronically, clinically depressed. We don't want that. We don't want to be in that statistic. That's a bad statistic. Um, so how do we help? How, how do we keep that from happening? One, and a big one, and this is coming from someone who does counseling, <laughs> so I'm a little biased, but it, it's the research says it's helpful, so it's helpful. Um, that families need to be encouraged to seek out services for themselves. That it's not just about getting their child all mm -hmm. the services that they need, but if they need a counselor, if they need somebody to talk to, to get that for themselves as well. They've got to learn how to cope with all this stress. Sometimes we think we've got it all together, but then all those warning signs start to show up, so we clearly don't. And so sometimes a counselor is all you need. It may be a few sessions. It may be long term. It's all going to depend on you and what you need, but learning how to cope mm -hmm. is going to be important. Um, those who feel like they have support from others and feel like they have access to resources tend to do better. And that's why you're here today. Yes. <laughs> so good for you. 
um, cohesiveness structure and positive reciprocal relationships among your spouse. So that statistic earlier about increased turmoil and decreased marital satisfaction, not a good thing, right? We, in order to buffer against a lot of the stress is to make sure that you've got a solid relationship with your spouse. So that might mean couples therapy. That might be what's needed to help you guys get back on the same page and, and love each other mm -hmm. again so you can support mm -hmm. each other and not be chronically stressed. I mentioned earlier redefining goals and expectations. Maybe you had in your mind that your child was going to go to Rice University and be a PhD and do these wonderful, amazing things. But maybe she's not. And so then you have to adjust your your thoughts and, and your, your goals for them and make them realistic. Not to say you're going to shortchange them, but we've got to be realistic as well. Extended family invo involvement. Sometimes extended family is a great thing. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's all dependent, right, on our dysfunctionally functional families. Um, but for those who feel like they have support from their extended families tend to do better. Leisure activities are important, especially, especially, especially for the primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. It can't be always about the child. It's got to be about you, too. You've got to take care of yourself. Don't feel guilty about it, because if you're not doing it, they're not getting the best of you. Sibling support versus uh, via support groups, counseling, parent education, one-on-one -on -one time with the parents. So there are sibling support groups out there. There are few and far between. They're hard to find, but they do exist. I know including kids, um, and Umble is one place that has them. Um, they're great. Um, counseling might be in order for the sibling as well. Um, like we're doing today, educating you guys on the sibling impact, making sure that we're paying attention to that and not forgetting them. And then making sure, like Mary said earlier, just that one-on-one -on -one time mm -hmm. with the sibling. Making sure that they're getting your attention, too, because it can be very easy. And it's not that we're doing it on purpose, mm -hmm. but it's very easy to focus all of our, or the majority of our attention on the child who needs the help and ignore the spouse and ignore the sibling. But they need your attention as well. And then respite. Respite care, very big. There are organizations around the city mm -hmm. that offer respite. Again, hard to find, but they do exist. Um, and if, if it's not an organization, getting it from a family member, very important um, to be able to take that time for yourself. And maybe even the non-blood family members, you know, those yeah. people that you love dearly, that you consider family that aren't really, that aren't connected by blood, those people come in very handy as well. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Taking care of your own needs. I've got this oxygen mask down here. Why yeah. do you think I have that down there? Does anybody know? Uh -huh. Yes. So, so what do they what do they say when you get on an airplane? Yes. Put it on yourself first. Why? You're not again. Absolutely. If you can't breathe, then you're not going to be able to help your child next to you or the person next to you. You've got to be able to breathe. It's only a split second, but you know our natural instinct is to. Do mm -hmm. this, but we've got to put our mask on ourselves so that we can be everything that they need for us to be. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do things for yourself in order to make that happen. So things like taking care of your own needs. If you want to go get that pedicure, but you're feeling guilty because I shouldn't be spending this money or I shouldn't take that hour, do it. Okay. <laughs> um, Whatever ways you find relaxing, meditation, exercising, hiking, whatever it is, everyone's mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. But don't not do it. Super important. Don't be afraid to ask for help. A lot of parents are very prideful. I've got this. I don't need anybody's help. They don't understand me anyway. We're just going to do it. The reality is you need to ask for help. You've got to ask for help. You've got to reach out because you need that break. Mm -hmm. Don't underestimate the power of friendships, like Mary said. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those will be there before your family. Family's great. Friends are great, too. They're mm -hmm. your extended family. Mm -hmm. Babysitters, hard to find. There are groups out there who train babysitters. Um, so be on the lookout for those. 
Um, again, being realistic with yourself and your family, making sure that your expectations are in line with reality, mm-hmm. and always, 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 always remembering that you're a good enough parent. <coughs> Often feel like you're not, but if you're giving everything that you've got, which might not be everything that that parent over there is doing, maybe they can do more, but if this is all you can do, and that's the best that you can do, then you're... That's good enough. That's good enough. Okay. And they may look like they're doing it, but you don't know what's going on inside their house or their head. (laughs) You really don't. Comparisons can be dangerous. Yes, don't do it. (laughs) Stay away. (laughs) Uh, Managing your stress from all angles. So I really like this diagram here. Breads, it's a good kind of breakdown of things you want to pay attention to. So you have the psychological side and the physiological side. Um, B is your belief system. So paying attention to your belief systems, those who have faith tend to be more resilient. On the physiological side, breath. Why is breathing important? And what kind of breathing am I talking about? Yes, deep diaphragmatic breathing. breathing. Um, If we breathe too much here in our chest, we're not getting enough oxygen to our brains. We're not, um, your, <laughs> your, your, your whole body, there's just, again, there's that mind-body connection. When we take those slow, long, deep breaths, it, keeps going up and up. it <laughs> opens up, your blood flows better, the mm-hmm. oxygen is flowing to your brain better, you will feel better. That's why when you go to yoga, they do those long breaths and you feel rejuvenated and amazing. That's why. Mm-hmm. It's all connected. When I teach breathing, I had, haven't taught it in a long time, but I, with kids, they're th- yeah, I am taking a deep breath. <gasps> <laughs> and the shoulders go way up. So I said, okay, do you know what your lungs look like? And, of course, most little kids don't. And I had a long balloon, the tear-shaped balloon. And I said, this is what your lungs look like. When you're breathing, <laughs> you're just getting this much at the top of your lung. Mm-hmm. Nothing's happening down here where all this big space is. You want the air to get down here. So you've got to f- breathe so that you make your tummy go out and get all that air in there. So think about that. Remember, when you're just <sighs> the short breaths, it's the top of your lungs, and you're not getting as much benefit of breath as you could. And the way I like to teach breathing for children, and it can work for us too because it might be fun for you too, is to blow bubbles. Because mm. right. it takes that slow, controlled breath to blow a good bubble. And so for kids, it's an easy way to teach them the type of breathing that Mary's talking about. Mm-hmm. But even for adults, it might be a fun thing to do because mm-hmm. it kind of brings you back to your childhood for a second. Um, but yes, breath. Okay, R, relationships and relaxation. So a strong social support system is important. On the physiological side, taking regular breaks, hourly, daily, monthly, yearly, plan vacations, Use your sick time. There's more to life Mm -hmm. than work. E, education. Learn something new. Practice what you learn. Have a hobby. Right? Mm -hmm. Keeps us stimulated. Keeps us active. Exercising often. Strengthening flexibility. I'm not talking about going to the gym and living there, (laughs) but... Giving yourself some physical exercise, that does something to our brain. It changes our mm-hmm. dopamine levels. It changes our endorphins. It, get it Physically, it makes us feel better. So exercise is important. Mm-hmm. It's all tied together, mind, body. Attitude, staying positive. Optimists tend to live longer. <laughs> there you go. You know, you know the said. gratitude, <laughs> years ago, the gratitude journal was the big thing, mm-hmm. and you were supposed to make a gratitude journal. Well, I was going through a kind of a crummy time in my life at that point. But I thought, okay, I'll try this. And there were some days that it was like the cat didn't scratch me. It was a, you know, a gratitude thing. Mm-hmm. S- but if you get in the habit of, at the end of the day, taking stock mm-hmm. and thinking about a couple of things that were good that day, mm-hmm. it really does, long term, help you become a more positive person. Absolutely. I call it my silver lining. Mm-hmm. Where's my silver lining for today? 
it might be just the fact that I had a good lunch today and that was the only thing that went right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm going to focus on before I go to bed. Yeah. Um, it might be that it was a really awesome day and that's great. But there's always, 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 um, even in the worst and most stressful of days, going to be something that you can point out that went okay. And so that's what you want to focus on mm -hmm. before you close your eyes and go to sleep at the end of the day. Find your silver lining. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not naturally an optimist, work mm -hmm. on it. <laughs> okay. Um, activity, again, that kind of goes mm -hmm. with exercise. Just staying active is important for stress relief. The D stands for determination. Staying committed to your plan and never giving up. Staying committed to your family. Staying committed to your goals. Not giving in. Yeah, it's stressful. You're being reasonable. You're, you're, you've got your expectations and they're in line. Um, but don't give up. Mm -hmm. Diet. I'm not saying to get on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying to be health, healthful. Eat healthful foods. Mm -hmm. um, there's some stuff out there about how mood and foods are connected. Mm -hmm. That's not my area. I'm not going to say what to eat and what not to eat. Um, but having a healthy diet mm -hmm. keeps you healthy. You feel better. Your stress, it's going to help. And then the last one is serenity and sleep. So serenity, practicing having internal peace and calmness of mind. So a lot of mindfulness techniques, meditation, yoga, goes back to that deep breathing, all helpful with stress management. And sleep. All of us are probably sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. Whether it's you're working on your dissertation mm -hmm. or you've got a bunch of kids at home and you're putting on 70 hours a week, sleep is important. Mm -hmm. Without it, we don't do very well. Mm -mm. So our bodies need it. Our brains need it. It's the number one restorative thing we can do. So sleep. Mm -hmm. Maintaining your priorities. Work should come last. I know and I am the biggest hypocrite in the world <laughs> with this. Okay? I'm going to fess up. <laughs> but work should <laughs> not be the priority. Your faith has to be a priority. Your spouse or your partner has to be a priority. Your child is also a priority, but notice where I have her or him in the list. Mm -hmm. Everything else after that, extended family, friends, work, maintaining your boundaries, knowing what you're okay with and what you're not okay with, not stretching yourself too thin, knowing when to say no. All very important. It's okay to say no. We might feel guilty for it, but it's still okay. Mm -hmm. if, if we've got three weekends in a row where there's family functions going on and you just don't have it in you to do all three, it's okay if you miss one. They'll understand. And if they don't, that's their issue, right? Mm -hmm. that's the, you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to know where to set those boundaries. All about stress relief, right? Mm -hmm. This comes from Stephen Covey, which is the guy who wrote the book um, Seven, Seven Habits of the Most Effective People. Yeah. So not related, but I still think useful. He breaks things down into four quadrants for time management and helping to find balance. The first one talks about what's urgent and important, so things that you can't really ignore. The examples are a hungry baby, broken pipe, or a burglar. You can't ignore those things, so you've got to jump on them and handle them. Okay, you've got to manage them. Keyword is managing. Then you have this not urgent but important quadrant, exercise, spirituality, and planning. You want to be able to focus on those. They're important. Okay? They're not urgent, but they're definitely important, and you want to make sure that you're focusing on them. Down at the bottom, quadrant three, urgent but not important. Ringing phones, interruptions, television shows, busy work. Avoid them as much as you can. They're not important. They might feel like they're important at the time, but they're not. So it's okay to avoid it. And then quadrant four, not urgent and not important. Video games, busy work, surfing the net, playing on Facebook, doing all those things. Pinterest, fun, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Limit that. It's trivial. It's a waste of time most of the time. It's not important. It's not urgent. 
We'll you talk know, about stress management. Mm -hmm. Time management is key in that. I just noticed when you look at all the items in, in quadrant four, they're all solitary. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we don't want to spend too much time being solitary. Yeah. And isolated. Yeah. And isolated. Yeah. So where you, where you want to try to function the most is in quadrant two. It's important, but it's not urgent. That's where you want to spend most of your time if you can. Okay? Because taking care of you means mm -hmm. the people in your life will receive the best of you rather than what's left of you. Okay. So if you don't have a child on the spectrum but you know someone who might, what do you do? You can ask them Ask them about their mm -hmm. child. Don't be afraid to ask and say, how's Johnny doing? Mm -hmm. You know, They want to talk about their kid. Ask about their unique gifts and what makes them mm -hmm. awesome, what makes them special and unique. Don't be afraid to ask to help. Don't be afraid to offer to babysit or help them run errands. Invite them over for parties and get-togethers. Make available places for them if the child gets overwhelmed and they need a place because they're having a meltdown, make sure that you have that space available for them. Allow them to vent because you know they're going to need to vent, but try to help them focus on the positive without minimizing their experience. So don't just, oh, it's going to be okay and ignore it because that's not helpful either. Mm -hmm. That's minimizing, but validating their experience. I hear you. It's tough. How can I help? Don't ignore, don't assume, don't offer pity because they don't want it, but offer support and compassion. On the physiological side, breath. Why is grieving important and what kind of grieving am I talking about? Deep yes, breathing. deep diaphragmatic breathing. breathing. Um, if we breathe too much here in our chest, we're not getting enough oxygen to our brains. We're not, um, we're not <laughs> your, your, your whole body, there's just, again, there's that mind-body connection. When we take those slow, long, deep breaths, <laughs> it opens <laughs> up, your blood flows better, the mm -hmm. oxygen is flowing to your brain better, you will feel better. Mm -hmm. That's why when you go to yoga, they do those long breaths and you feel rejuvenated and amazing. That's why. It's all connected. When I teach breathing, I had, haven't taught it in a long time, but I, with kids, they're, yeah, I am taking a deep breath. <gasps> <laughs> and the shoulders go way up. So I said, okay, do you know what your lungs look like? And, of course, most little kids don't. And I had a long balloon, the tear-shaped balloon. And I said, this is what your lungs look like. When you're breathing, <gasps> you're just getting this much at the top of your lung. Mm -hmm. Nothing's happening down here where all this big space is. You want the air to get down here. So you've got to breathe so that you make your tummy go out and get all that air in there. So think about that. Remember when you're just <sighs> the short breaths, it's the top of your lungs and you're not getting as much benefit of breath as you could. And the way I like to teach breathing for children, and it can work for us too because it might be fun for you too, is to blow bubbles. Because mm. right. it takes that slow, controlled breath to blow a good bubble. And so for kids, it's an easy way to teach them the type of breathing that Mary's talking about. Mm -hmm. But even for adults, it might be a fun thing to do because mm -hmm. it kind of brings you back to your childhood for a second. Um, but yes, breath. Okay, R, relationships and relaxation. So a strong social support system is important. On the physiological side, taking regular breaks, hourly, daily, monthly, yearly, plan vacations, Use your sick time. There's more to life mm -hmm. than work. E, education. Learn something new. Practice what you learn. Have a hobby, right? Mm -hmm. Keeps us stimulated, keeps us active. Exercising often, strengthening flexibility. I'm not talking about going to the gym and living there, <laughs> but giving yourself some physical exercise that does something to our brain it changes our mm -hmm. dopamine levels it changes our endorphins it get it physically it makes us feel better so exercise is important mm -hmm. it's all tied together mind body attitude
staying positive. Optimists tend to live longer. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You know, the said. gratitude, <laughs> years ago, the gratitude journal was the big thing, mm -hmm. and you were supposed to make a gratitude journal. Well, I was going through a kind of a crummy time in my life at that point, but I thought, okay, I'll try this. And there were some days that it was like the cat didn't scratch me was a you know a gratitude thing mm -hmm. but if you get in the habit of at the end of the day taking stock mm -hmm. and thinking about a couple of things that were good that day it really does long term help you become a more positive person absolutely i call it my silver lining mm -hmm. where's my silver lining for today it might be just the fact that i had a good lunch today and that was the only thing that went right mm -hmm. so that's what i'm going to focus on before i go to bed yeah um, it might be that it was a really awesome day, and that's great, but there's always, 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 um, even in the worst and most stressful of days, going to be something that you can point out that went okay. And so that's what you want to focus on mm -hmm. before you close your eyes and go to sleep at the end of the day. Find your silver lining. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not naturally an optimist, work mm -hmm. on it. <laughs> okay? Um, activity, again, that kind of goes mm -hmm. with exercise. Just staying active is important for stress relief. The D stands for determination, staying committed to your plan and never giving up, staying committed to your family, staying committed to your goals, not giving in. Yeah, it's stressful. You're being reasonable. You're, you're, you've got your expectations and they're in line, um, but don't give up. Mm -hmm. Diet. I'm not saying to get on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying to be health, healthful, eat healthful foods. Mm -hmm. um, there's some stuff out there about how mood and foods are connected. Mm -hmm. That's not my area. I'm not going to say what to eat and what not to eat. Um, but having a healthy diet mm -hmm. keeps you healthy. You feel better. Your stress, it's going to help. And then the last one is serenity and sleep. So serenity, practicing having internal peace and calmness of mind. So a lot of mindfulness techniques, meditation, yoga, goes back to that deep breathing, all helpful with stress management, and sleep. All of us are probably sleep deprived, mm -hmm. whether it's you're working on your dissertation or you've got a bunch of kids at home and you're putting on 70 hours a week. Sleep is important. Mm -hmm. Without it, we don't do very well. Mm -mm. So our bodies need it. Our brains need it. It's the number one restorative thing we can do. So sleep. Okay. Maintaining your priorities. Work should come last. I know and I am the biggest hypocrite in the world <laughs> with this. Okay? I'm going to fess up. <laughs> but work should <laughs> not be the priority. Your faith has to be a priority. Your spouse or your partner has to be a priority. Your child is also a priority, but notice where I have her or him in the list. Mm -hmm. Everything else after that, extended family, friends, work, maintaining your boundaries, knowing what you're okay with and what you're not okay with, not stretching yourself too thin, knowing when to say no. All very important. It's okay to say no. We might feel guilty for it, but it's still okay. Mm -hmm. if, if we've got three weekends in a row where there's family functions going on and you just don't have it in you to do all three, it's okay if you miss one. They'll understand. And if they don't, that's their issue, right? Mm -hmm. that's the, you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to know where to set those boundaries. All about stress relief, right? Mm -hmm. This comes from Stephen Covey, which is the guy who wrote the book um, Seven, Seven Habits of the Most Effective People. Yeah. So not related, but I still think useful. He breaks things down into four quadrants for time management and helping to find balance. The first one talks about what's urgent and important, so things that you can't really ignore. The examples are a hungry baby, broken pipe, or a burglar. You can't ignore those things, so you've got to jump on them and handle them. Okay, you've got to manage them keyword is managing. Then you have this not urgent but important quadrant, exercise, spirituality, and planning. You want to be able to focus on those. They're important. 
okay? They're not urgent, but they're definitely important and you wanna make sure that you're focusing on them. Down at the bottom, quadrant three, urgent but not important. Ringing phones, interruptions, television shows, busy work, avoid them as much as you can. They're not important. They might feel like they're important at the time, but they're not, so it's okay to avoid it. And then quadrant four, not urgent and not important. Video games, busy work, surfing the net, playing on Facebook, doing all those things, Pinterest, fun, <laughs> awesome. Limit that. It's trivial. It's a waste of time most of the time. It's not important. It's not urgent. We you talk about stress management. Mm -hmm. Time management is key in that. I just noticed when you look at all the items in, in quadrant four, they're all solitary. And we don't want to spend too much time being solitary. Yeah. And isolated. Yeah. And isolated. Yeah. So where you, where you want to try to function the most is in quadrant two. It's important, but it's not urgent. That's where you want to spend most of your time if you can. Okay? Because taking care of you means mm -hmm. the people in your life will receive the best of you rather than what's left. So if you don't have a child on the spectrum, but you know someone who might, what do you do? You can ask them, ask them about mm -hmm. their child. Don't be afraid to ask and say, how's Johnny doing? Mm -hmm. You know, They want to talk about their kid. Ask about their unique gifts and what makes them mm -hmm. awesome, what makes them special and unique. Don't be afraid to ask to help. Don't be afraid to offer to babysit or help them run errands. Invite them over for parties and get-togethers. Make available places for them. If the child gets overwhelmed and they need a place because they're having a meltdown, make sure that you have that space available for them. Allow them to vent because you know they're going to need to vent. But try to help them focus on the positive without minimizing their experience. So don't just, oh, it's going to be okay, and ignore it because that's not helpful either. Mm -hmm. That's minimizing but validating their experience. I hear you, it's tough, how can I help? Don't ignore, don't assume, don't offer pity, because they don't want it, but offer support and compassion. 